good afternoon everyone and uh, for those of you joining from elsewhere if it's uh, morning time good morning everyone uh, welcome good to the everyone. Okay, welcome to the uh, Spark Pedagogical Lecture Series on Instabilities, Waves and Mixing in Stratified Flows. So this lecture series is being uh, organized and brought to you together by Indian Institute of Technology, Madras and uh, ENS de Lyon. This is being held under the Spark program in which uh, the five uh, investigators on screen uh, are working on triadic resonance and stratified shear flows in general. And part of the program is to uh, organize this uh, lecture series. As the title says, this is uh, targeted towards uh, an audience of uh, researchers who are beginning research in this uh, general area of stratified flows. So we have made sure all the lectures are at a beginner's level uh, for someone who is planning to uh, start research in this area or is just just started is interested to know what the outstanding questions are uh, those are the audience that we are uh, interested in addressing or uh, we have uh, organized the lectures around uh, just give me one moment I am uh, Manikandar Mathur in the Department of Aerospace Engineering at IIT Madras. Uh, my colleague Anubhav Roy is in the Department of uh, Applied Mechanics at IIT Madras. And uh, the three uh, French colleagues joining from ENS Lyon in this lecture series are uh, Thierry Doxwa, Sylvain Joubo, and uh, Philippe Odier. Uh, as you see on the screen, we have, uh, we have uh, two lectures every day of this week. From Monday to Friday and we start from uh, the basics of hydrodynamic stability and slowly build towards uh, more advanced topics on uh, mostly internal gravity waves but also maybe related phenomena in stratified flows. Uh, we only expect a fluid mechanics background from the audience and uh, everything else hopefully is built into uh, the lecture content. Uh, we would also like these uh, lectures to be interactive to the extent possible. So if you have questions, feel free to interrupt by either uh, raising your hand on the Zoom uh, app, or you can also type in your questions on the Zoom chat window or on the chat window in the YouTube link. Uh, we have had uh, quite a lot of registrations, so it is possible that if uh, the number of uh, participants exceeds uh, 100, you may have to go to the YouTube link uh, to the, view the video. Nevertheless, you would still be able to type in your questions in the live YouTube link and uh, we would make sure one of us uh, takes a look and spend some time either during a break uh, in the lecture or at the end of the lecture to address all the questions. So we have two lectures uh, today. Each of them, uh, we've given uh, each lecture a two hour time slot, depending on how the interaction goes and uh, we may have a short break in between. And if there are more questions, we are more interested in making sure we address as many questions as possible. We are not so concerned by uh, covering all the material that we have uh, prepared on, okay? So Anubhav will be talking today on hydrodynamic uh, stability method of normal modes and uh, take those towards uh, talking about uh, waves and fluids in general. And uh, tomorrow, I will be talking about uh, the linear internal waves and uh, Silva from ENS Lyon will uh, give his first lecture on experimental studies on internal waves and uh, stratified flows in general. And on Wednesday, Thierry Doxua will talk about uh, nonlinear internal waves and Silvan's uh, second uh, lecture on experimental studies uh, will be in the second half of uh, Wednesday. Then on uh, Thursday, the first lecture is again by me on uh, internal waves in the ocean. Uh, 
so we, we will uh, spend a little bit of time talking about why internal waves are important to study in the ocean and what uh, uh, the relevant uh, questions for the ocean are. And uh, we have uh, two lectures given by Philippe uh, Odier on Thursday and Friday on mixing in stratified flows. That's an outstanding uh, research topic, uh, not often covered in uh, introductory courses, but uh, nevertheless, hopefully we'll come to appreciate that uh, mixing in stratified flows is of uh, huge importance uh, to study the atmosphere or the ocean. And uh, we also have uh, a lecture on Friday by Thierry Doxo, continuing from his uh, nonlinear internal waves lecture. The, his, uh, his last lecture will be on hydrodynamic solitons. As I said, uh, please feel free to uh, raise questions either by raising your hand, putting it in the chat window on Zoom or uh, YouTube. If not, if, if uh, you want to communicate some questions by, via email to one of uh, me or Anubab, that's that would be fine too. We'll make sure those questions are uh, addressed in the following lecture or at the next earliest instance possible. So without uh, uh, spending any more time on the introductory part, I will now hand over uh, the lecture to Anubhav, who will get started with uh, his lecture on hydrodynamic stability method of normal modes. Anubhav, could you please take over? So Anubhav, just confirming that uh, you heard is my, me, uh, I think you're on Is my uh, screen right. visible? So is everyone able to hear me? Uh, can someone just confirm? Yes, sir. We're able to hear you. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Good afternoon, good morning to all of you. Thank you for joining in. Uh, as Mani already mentioned, this is going to be a lecture on pretty much starting from hydrodynamic stability and uh, using that as an introduction to move on and learn more about uh, internal waves, both linear and nonlinear, uh, looking into aspects of experimental nature in internal waves, then moving on to uh, things like solitons and mixing and stratified flows. So today's lecture would primarily be uh, of the kind where we create some groundwork uh, for learning about stability, learning about waves and fluids. Uh, this will obviously not be a complete exhaustive background that we can do because typically these things would uh, span over uh, multiple courses in a regular semester uh, format. But what we would try, the objective here is that for those who are not familiar at all with the domain, you get some flavor of how we look into problems in uh, fluid mechanics uh, from the purview of looking at them as oscillations. Uh, how do we understand instabilities? How do we actually analyze instabilities? Uh, so there are going to be two lectures today. Uh, one of them would be on method of normal mode. So we'll discuss uh, how we analyze fluid mechanics problems and try to probe instabilities and try to probe and find out waves in the system. The second part would be more working out uh, uh, different kinds of waves. So we'll take simple examples and try to see uh, if we can get a feel for how to find things like the wave speed. Uh, so preferably if you have a pen and paper uh, lying around, it would be useful to actually uh, along the way work it out. So the first part we will try to give a more of, of a summary in the first half of the lecture today. 
uh, around an hour mark maybe i'll just take a few minutes break uh, you can uh, anyway ask questions in between uh, if you wish to raise your hand uh, one of the co host would uh, interrupt me and let me know you can also go ahead and uh, ask yourself uh, just make sure that uh, if someone is already asking you let them finish and then uh, go ahead but please do interrupt and ask question because the whole objective of these set of lectures is uh, for couple of you who would not be familiar with this area to give you a flavor some of you would might probably find this initial introductory material uh, already to be taught in different courses but uh, the idea is to reach out to a more uh, general audience so we will look into method of normal modes and the context where we are going to do this in this in the context of hydrodynamic instability and uh, if you think of scenarios where you actually see instability so in fluid mechanics actually instabilities are uh, probably seen before bit than you do the math before you actually work out the math of the problem you possibly see them happening all around you so these are typically three uh, kitchen examples of instabilities the top left is a stream of liquid which is trickling down and uh, you see that that fine nice cylindrical uh, filament that's there that filament actually breaks down so you have a filament and this filament effectively breaks down into uh, spheres so when you look at the second case the top the middle one is a case where you have a plate of liquid a thin shallow layer of liquid which is heated from the bottom so i'm heating it from the bottom and uh, if the top could be a free surface or it could be another cold surface but effectively the top is maintained at a lower temperature than the bottom so you have a temperature profile where the bottom the bottom plate is actually hotter than the cold plate so in such a circumstance uh you create a setting which is gravitationally unstable because if the if you use a linear equation of state the density of the fluid which is at the bottom uh is actually lighter than at the top and beyond a certain temperature gradient so there would be a way of quantifying this in a non dimensional sense but if you think of that if the temperature gradient becomes steep enough then it is becomes impossible to sustain this and convection sets in so what you are seeing on the middle panel is where uh, it's a visualization from the top and you see the from the top you can actually see these patterns which are forming so these patterns are so you are viewing it from in from this direction from the top and uh, you will actually beyond a certain critical uh, temperature gradient which gets quantified using a non dimensional number there will be circulation cells that would actually be set up and that's the pattern that you are seeing from the top now the scenario in the top right is where you have milk being added to coffee and here you are also trying to add something else in the system so you have a, a case where there is sugar being added now you if you observe carefully the the coffee is obviously hot now you're going to introduce cold milk but you are not going to introduce it at the top of the hot coffee because if you do that then obviously it's like this setting here where you have a heavy uh, i mean a hotter fluid which is lying uh, below a colder fluid now here if you observe so when you set this up the temperature you are trying to add cold milk below a hot coffee so the temperature profile continues to remain this this is the temperature profile so since you have a temperature profile which is so let me so you have actually here hot coffee and there is cold milk so it's a temperature profile where 
the temperature on top is actually higher than the temperature at the bottom so you would naturally expect that nothing should happen in this system because you have a heavy fluid which is uh, lying below a lighter fluid but then you observe these nice uh, fingering pattern that is actually setting in here and the question is why does this happen so here if you noticed in the earlier stage of the video uh, sugar was being additionally added at the bottom so besides the temperature effect there is also an aspect of these dissolved solute even in this case sugar so if you think in terms of the density the density of this system would actually depend on the temperature so you increase the temperature the density is going to get lowered but there is also going to be a dependence on the dissolved concentration that you have of the solute so you can treat it like salinity and that can actually also change the density and change the density in the opposite manner so you have more dissolved stuff at the bottom so the bottom actually and on the top so you have a gradient of salinity or gradient of sugar concentration here and this diffusion of these two species there is temperature and the other one is the dissolved solute this can then set into a convection scenario which is happening because of the two competition now these kinds of uh observations can also be seen in uh, through simulations where you can actually perform a numerical simulation of the governing equations and you can observe pretty much the same thing that's happening so again the bottom left is the undulations that are there on a cylindrical filament that leads that beyond a certain uh, wavelength of undulation it becomes impossible for it to sustain and it breaks down into the spherical droplets the middle one is the case where you have again the hot plate in the bottom and a cold plate on top and uh, spontaneously beyond a certain temperature gradient you have these convection rolls being set up and the last one is where we have both temperature as well as salinity which is present in the system so the temperature gradient can be favorable where you have hot fluid on top of cold fluid but the salinity gradient can be unfavorable and it's the competition of the two which can actually drive this kind of uh, instability so this is uh, typically what you would observe uh, in uh, a wide range of circumstances of instabilities actually set in and uh, it need not always be unstable so what you see here at the bottom this is a case of a spherical drop which uh, does not really break up but undergo oscillations so what we are going to also talk about would be circumstances of instability as well as settings where there are no instabilities but there can be oscillations waves in the system so the second part of uh, today's lecture would actually focus on those kinds of oscillations in a system which we will be calling as the waves in the fluids now what is our objective of aerodynamic stability now when we are introduced to equations in fluid mechanics we try to work out in some cases the equations of motion now sometimes the equations of motion can be derived using pen and paper there are simple analytical solutions but they are fewer in nature because these are effectively nonlinear equations so in other cases you would derive these uh, solutions using a numerical uh, approach but the question is whether it's a solution that has been derived analytically or is a solution derived numerically would such a solution be observable in nature and that's the question which aerodynamic stability attempts to answer that even though you might have a mathematical solution to the governing navier stokes equation they may not necessarily occur in nature and the fact that they whether they occur or they do not occur, occur in nature has got to do with the fact whether these are stable or unstable solutions so you can always say that i can take a pen and try to balance it in this manner using my finger i can hold it and i'm basically balancing it upside down and i give it a small tap and uh, if i am holding it in a perfect manner then a small tap would lead to some kind of an oscillation and it will come back to its initial location now you can do the same exercise and you can actually say that i'm holding this pen and it's going to be almost impossible to balance it on my fingertip but say i was able to do it now that would be a state of perfect force and torque balance in the static state it's it's actually a state where all the forces and moments are balanced but the moment i give it a small tap 
it flips over. It tips over because any small deviation from that state gives rise to a torque which is not restoring. It's a destabilizing torque. And this is basically the idea that you can have equilibrium states or steady states for a, uh, for a given uh, problem, but they may not necessarily be observable. It's very difficult to observe a pen or uh, any elongated objects standing upside down on a surface. It's nearly impossible. So that's basically coming from the fact that it is an unstable solution. So the same point of view exists in fluid mechanics, that we will not be able to actually see a solution just because it's all zero governing differential equation. In real life, you would actually going to see a solution that is stable to disturbances. So now if you ask the question that if I've observed an instability, does it necessarily mean that I'm basically observing a turbulent flow? Now that need not be the case. You can have a, back, a background flow, which when you impose disturbances, it undergoes an, an instability, but necessarily not into a turbulent flow. So that path to turbulence can be more complicated. But the question we are asking here that if I take a flow state, can I actually have the flow respond to a disturbance and I want to understand that response to some disturbances and we are going to right now restrict ourselves to disturbances which will be infinitesimal in magnitude. We'll define these things mathematically. What do we mean by them being infinitesimal? To what? Infinitesimal or small in context to which other variable? So this is something that has been in the thought process of many uh, in trying to understand uh, what drives a flow from a nice orderly state uh, to something that is highly disorderly has a certain inherent randomness into it. How does this happen? Without basically changing uh, anything regarding, let's say, the geometry, just by changing, let's say, some kind of a forcing in the problem, I can actually take a flow to a nice orderly state to a highly disorderly state. And this has been a question that people have been asking for a long period of time that if I give an infinitely small variation, so this is in the word of Maxwell, an infinitely small variation of the present state will alter only by an infinitely small quantity of time. That's basically the definition of what you mean by it being stable. And then the, 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 the reverse would be when it actually becomes unstable, that it brings about a finite difference in the state. Now, these obviously got laid down in a more mathematical uh, setting. Now, incidentally, the history of stability or the, how we actually uh, understand stability theory started out rather looking at a problem which didn't really necessarily have an instability. It was more looking at what happens to a free surface of water. There is air on top, there is water below, and we, this will be a large chunk of what we'll talk in today's second half. And if I perturb that system, if I disturb that system, it basically leads to waves. All of us have seen that. You don't need to know fluid mechanics. You don't need to know the equations of fluid mechanics, but you would invariably see it. You would see it on the ocean. You would see it in a bottle of water. If you have a bottle of water, and if I hold this bottle of water and I give it a tap, I can clearly see that the surface, the interface of that water bottle or the water surface undergoes nice wave-like motion. And this has been probably the uh, beginning of doing a stability calculation of a fluid mechanics problem. So it was not trying to understand when something becomes unstable, but rather in trying to describe that if a system is being excited, it's been perturbed, then if there are some restoring forces in the system, it would give rise to oscillations, knowing what we already know from simple point per mass systems like pendulum. So pretty much the 18th century was preoccupied with this approach, where you had a series of French mathematicians. I'm just listing here the key four figures in this uh, theory, Laplace, Lagrange, Poisson, Cauchy. You might have definitely heard their names in other contexts, but they were the pioneers of uh, the development of the water wave theory, trying to understand that if I have just the simple question that I have a pool of, pool of water with air on top, and if I look at what happens when I disturb this system. If I take this system away from its static state, obviously we understand hydrostatics, we know what is the hydrostatic pressure, but if I take it away from the static state, how will the dynamic state actually look like? And that's the question which can be viewed as the birth of doing a uh, stability calculation. 
now this is this is not necessarily something that's uh, a done and dusted kind of a feel it's not something that you would imagine okay we are talking here about times 18th century so 250 odd years back people have been looking at this so you would imagine that by virtue of their ancientness these are problems which people have looked at and there is nothing there is really nothing to actually solve for so here i'm showing a very recent uh, set of work done by professor atul das gupta and, and his students at iit bombay where they have been asking a classical question of a pool of liquid where so this is the problem where if you drop a pebble into a pond you would see these nice ripples actually propagate out we all would have seen this i mean if you have access to even a tub of water in your bathroom you can try it out you give a small uh indentation in the center you give a, you you either can dip your finger and lift it up or you can drop a small piece of a uh, rock or any object which creates uh, a uh, create some disturbance and that you will see propagate out in this nice circular wave fronts and this is actually called the cauchy poisson problem and this even though we are talking about gentlemen who are from the 18th century even now there are some very interesting aspects of this problem which we don't really know that well that why does how do these things actually propagate so this is just to give you give an idea for students that sometimes just the way virtue of problems being ancient doesn't mean that there are nothing there's nothing interesting more to do here now if we come to the conventional understanding of stability where we are actually asking the question when does something actually become unstable and uh, this uh, started mostly in the 19th century and where you were asking more about i have a flow and if i was the question when would this flow actually become disorderly so we all have learned about hagen poiseuille flow when we learned fluid mechanics and this was hagen's calculation was probably the first results in transition you see some sh sharp fluctuations beyond a certain value of visco viscosity so the way he was looking at it was if you decrease viscosity viscosity is a function of temperature if you keep decrease decreasing viscosity beyond a certain uh, decrease you start seeing some sharp fluctuations not very quantifiable uh, experiments but nonetheless a question being asked that when would something uh, start becoming unstable and the people who really led to this field emerge out predominantly were helmholtz kelvin and rayle and uh, this obviously got uh, an extremely strong footing with experiments by renaults uh, all of us when we learn either stability theory or turbulence or also sometimes in the context of just a general course in fluid mechanics we are told about renaults uh, seminal experiments where he observed that in a pipe flow if you introduce disturbances those disturbances actually i mean so he was introducing a die and those die would actually undergo a sharp fluctuating state uh, beyond a certain flow rate and uh, this was something that uh, intrigued and also uh, interested uh, rayle and stokes and uh, stokes incidentally i mean so there is something called the adams prize which usually students in cambridge would write a mathematical essay on and uh, kelvin had made an attempt to actually answer this question which uh, rayle wasn't particularly happy with the solution and then uh, he went ahead and uh, try to come up with his own criteria when this flow would be unstable and if you look at this problem the history of this problem that just flow through a tube and you are asking the question that when would this become unstable and why does this become unstable see you are not changing anything in the tube the only thing you are probably changing or the only thing you are probably changing is the flow rate so if you change the rate or the pressure drop if you are changing the pressure drop in the in the system you observe that there is a certain pressure drop and obviously renaults was able to also argue for this mechanical similarity and come up with this non dimensional number the renaults number such that beyond a critical renaults number the flow stops being an orderly flow it becomes a disorderly flow and there are several other key names who worked on this who incidentally never really uh made name in fluid mechanics but were pretty much famous in other areas one of them being heisenberg Heisenberg's PhD thesis was actually 
precisely on this problem. He was a student of Sommerfeld and he was given this problem for his PhD to work out when would the pipe flow problem actually or when would a, a, a shear flow problem become unstable. And uh, you realize how formidable it is when you actually go through the literature and realize how many uh, great minds have worked on this and, real, and understood that this is a fairly non-trivial problem. There are still aspects of it which you don't really understand well. And even this experiment of uh, Reynolds, which was for a pipe, we will see today towards the end of the lecture that uh, I'll introduce you a whole bunch of things regarding how to solve for stability of fluid flows. But this going back, if you go back to this problem, you realize that there are certain things which are missing and we are not able to explain. So we'll, we'll touch upon that in the end. Now, if you have to say the theory of aerodynamic stabilities and uh, how did the uh, approach actually became, uh, became so successful as it has, you can't really uh, do it without mentioning the name of G.I. Taylor. Uh, Taylor was a mathematician, a physicist, an experimentalist. Uh, he was a para jumper. He was a bunch of different things. And in every aspect, he was a genius. But if I just keep this restricted to hydrodynamic instabilities and just stick to what he did in this area, there are three key instabilities which we often uh, discuss that owe their name to Taylor and what he had actually done. The bottom left is what is called as a Safman-Taylor instability. So this is when you were trying to push a low viscous fluid into a high viscous fluid. So the interface between the two fluid undergo this kind of a nice fingering pattern. And this is something which is quite important when you are thinking of displacing fluid in a porous medium. You are trying to either uh, extract or displace out of fluid in that medium. And you see this uh, beautiful fingering pattern there. The, uh, the second one is what's called as a Rayleigh-Taylor instability. So this is the extreme case of what we saw earlier. Here you have a hot fluid layer below a cold fluid layer. So it's not like the conduction profile by the temperature or the density is varying linearly. There is a jump. So you can imagine if you want to do this, uh, obviously you will create a mess, but the way to do this is you take your bottle of water, you unscrew the top, you hold it upside down, and if you remove your hand, you can do this as carefully as you want. I mean, you can do this with the utmost degree of care in the, in the finest precision manner, not in the clumsy way that I was showing you. You will still see an instability. I mean, instability means that the flow actually comes out. So that, that surface of water, which is on top of an air column, it's static solution of the governing equations. There is nothing that it violates in terms of uh, being a static solution of your governing uh, system. But it is completely unstable. Completely unstable means that you obviously cannot, I mean, for the parameters of an air water system, there is no way that you can actually make that system stay like in that manner. Now, obviously, you can tweak it for other fluid systems where you have a heavy fluid over a lighter fluid by probably playing around with the interfacial tens tension, viscosity, etc. But you can understand that this is trying to hold something which is heavy over a lighter system. It's a top heavy arrangement, which we will say for the context of just like a rigid body. The last one is uh, what is called as a Taylor Kuwait setup. So you have concentric cylinders and uh, You have uh, concentric cylinders. I'm not sure if the video is playing properly, but I'll describe what uh, that problem is about. So you have concentric cylinders where the inner cylinder is rotating and the outer cylinder is also rotating. Now, if you have the inner cylinder spin faster than the outer cylinder, you can find what is the angular velocity of the fluid. So this is again uh, a, a classical laminar solution of Navier-Stokes equation. You can take the Navier-Stokes equation, you can assume axisymmetry, you can assume that there is only a 
tangential component of velocity there are no radial or axial components of velocity you apply the boundary condition that in the inner cylinder it should be a rigid rotation of velocity omega inert times the radius of the inner cylinder and at the outer cylinder it should be an angular velocity which is the uh, outer cylinder angular velocity if you do that you would get a perfectly legitimate steady solution of the system now it turns out that if you spin the inner cylinder rapidly enough again you can you you can define a non dimensional number here too uh, to quantify this that if you are spinning it fast enough this problem actually becomes unstable which means it's not feasible to actually have this nice homogeneous state the flow basically breaks down and you start seeing different kinds of patterns i'll try to probably draw it here since the video is not playing where you have this band formation actually which occurs in this homogeneous fluid so you take a viscous fluid you spin the inner one you can hold the outer one at rest if you wish you can spin the inner one and as as you do this exercise you will see beyond the critical spin rate the flow becomes unstable and this is where the achievement of taylor actually uh, becomes prominent so he not only uh, did he perform these experiments you have to imagine these are experiments which were done in 1920s this is not by present day standards in terms of uh, access to uh, sophisticated instruments or computational tool he also performed a linear stability calculation he also performed a mathematical calculation to find out when would this be unstable and this is what you can actually see so he has a plot here this is from taylor's original paper he has a plot here where the y axis is the angular velocity of the inner cylinder and the x axis is the angular velocity of the outer cylinder and beyond the critical ang spin of the inner cylinder you start seeing the system being unstable and these dots that you have here these are what he had from his experiment and the curve is what he would get from his numerical calculation and you can see the degree of match that he has from both his own numerical calculation and the uh, experiments that he had performed and this kind of uh, made hydrodynamic stability such an important and powerful technique for analyzing uh, stability of fluid flows transition where people got that confidence that you can really go ahead and uh, predict when would a system be unstable by uh, using the tools of uh, stability analysis and uh, this is i think where uh, they are they have their credit one is the taylor kuwait flow which is uh, the case where you have the inner cylinder spinning and the outer cylinder is spinning slower where if you define a non dimensional number that's effectively the ratio of the centrifugal to viscous forces it turns out roughly close to 1700 and uh, from the experiment and you would find from taylor's theory it's around 1706 so you can see the degree of match that you get and the rayleigh bernard problem where you have a hot plate below and you have a cold plate on top so you have a conduction profile once again a steady laminar base state that base state turns out to be un uh, unstable beyond a certain value of rayleigh number which is the ratio of thermal to viscous forces and incidentally that number also turns out to be pretty close to the uh, taylor number and uh, if you do this calculation using theory you can either assume that the bottom and the top surface are free surface their interfaces or the bottom and the top surface a rigid surface so when you do that you get again a number which is pretty close to what you would observe from the experiments and uh, this is where linear stability really started getting its uh, credit uh, that you can use linear stability theory you can use the tools of hydrodynamic stability and understand what happens to fluid flows when would uh, a motion actually cease to exist and something else would happen that so something else necessarily is not always turbulent but it is definitely not the state which you started out with so for instance in the rayleigh bernard problem you had an initial conduction profile and this ceases to exist and you start seeing rolls in the problem 
Similarly, in the Taylor Kuwait problem, you have an uh, an initial homogeneous profile where the velocity is just azimuthal and it's the same everywhere. But then gradually you start seeing bands which start to form. And the numbers, the numbers being close to each other is, uh, I mean, it's not really very surprising if you understand the analogy between rotation and buoyancy. What, the, what role centrifugal force actually plays is analogous to what buoyancy force plays. And this, this kind of an analogy has been exploited uh, a lot in uh, different settings. So now we will actually see how do we go about uh, performing the stability analysis. So we'll first talk about normal modes. So we'll understand what normal modes are. Uh, we'll take simple vibration problems and get an idea for normal modes. Then we will uh, move on to linearization and trying to do it for the fluid mechanics equation. And then we will talk about the temporal stability analysis. So to understand what normal modes are, uh, the best example is take a simple harmonic oscillator. So if I have a point mass or a concentrated mass, which is suspended via an inextensible string or a rod from a support, and that string or the rod is, is massless, you ignore its mass. Then uh, if you ask the question, uh, that how do I write down uh, its equation of motion? You can do it using different approaches. One simple approach would be you calculate what would be the torque that is acting about the point of suspension. And then uh, you say that the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration is equal to this unbalanced torque. So that would be your Newton's second law for rotation. And uh, for this point mass, you can write down what would be the... Uh, moment of inertia. And when you do that, you get an equation of motion, which tells that the rate of change of theta, second derivative, theta double dot, plus g by L sine theta is equal to zero. So this, if you now write it in the small angle approximation, so if you say that theta is significantly small, then that sine theta can be approximated So I'll approximate sine theta as theta. So if I do that, then I get theta double dot plus G by L theta is equal to zero. And then I write it in the form of an oscillator equation, theta dot plus omega naught square theta is equal to zero. And uh, where omega naught is the frequency square root of G by L. So this tells us the oscillation of a pendulum, the frequency of oscillation. You could have also argued about this frequency of oscillation uh, from dimensional analysis, knowing that G and L are the parameters in the problem. So, but for the numerical prefactor, uh, you can actually say how would the frequency or time period depend on uh, G by L. Now, this is a system which has one degree of freedom. Now, if I go to more than one degree of freedom. So if I have a system of coupled oscillators, so there are two pendulums uh, which are uh, suspended from a rigid support and they're connected via a spring. So now you can ask the question that what would be their equation of motion and uh, how do I analyze the behavior of this? So once again, you can do different kinds of uh, approaches to arrive at the equation of motion. You can write down, do a force balance by uh, treating each of the pendulum independently with the spring force, coupling them together. You can do it using the work done. But finally, you are going to get an equation of motion for the two angles, theta one and theta two. But then that equation of motion that you get for the two pendulum coupling the arbitrary theta one and theta two isn't particularly very insightful because you are going to get some equation of motion which tells you that given the theta one, the, the, the value of theta one for pendulum one, how is theta two actually coupled to it? Now you can break this problem into two sub problems. 
in problem one, you can have the spring just remain unstretched or uncompressed. It, st it stays in its native length. So it's as if there is a rigid rod which is connecting the two pendulum. So if the two objects were swinging perfectly in sync, then theta one is equal to theta two is equal to theta. So then I can write down an equation of motion which doesn't really make any distinction that I have actually two objects here with two degrees of freedom. It's as if it's just a single object with a single degree of freedom. The other motion is where the two masses are swinging with the same amplitude but of opposite sign. So theta one is equal to minus theta two. So if you say that, you would write down an equation of motion because there is only one angle to bother about that is theta one. Theta two is equal to minus theta one. You would get an equation of motion in terms of this variable theta one where the oscillation frequency now actually depends on the stiffness of the spring. Because obviously when you are going outside, you are stretching the spring. When you are coming in, you are compressing the spring. So the spring now obviously enters into the in the motion via altering this frequency of oscillation. Now, what's the advantage of doing it this way? If I say that this is a symmetric motion and this is an anti-symmetric motion, what's the advantage of doing it using this symmetric and anti-symmetric approach? So let's say I have an initial condition, which is where the pendulum one hasn't really been altered in any way. So let me call this as one. This is two. So I have not really done anything uh, to change uh, the motion, the initial condition that I've given to the system. Pendulum one hasn't really been displaced. It's only pendulum two, which has been displaced. Right? So let's say that this has a displacement which is alpha and pendulum one has no displacement. So what I can do, I can do a case where both the pendulum are displaced in the anti-symmetric sense by alpha by two and in the symmetric sense alpha by two. So you can see this, this combination is a way of representing this kind of an irregular initial condition. Irregular in a sense, like it's not symmetric or anti-symmetric. So I'm taking an initial condition which has some arbitrary displacement given to pendulum two, but nothing to pendulum one. So then I can write this as a combination of a symmetric mode and an anti-symmetric mode. And since I know the motion of these two modes, the symmetric mode and the anti-symmetric mode. And this is a non, this is a linear problem. There is no non-linear uh, term in the system. If I know the amount of stuff that I should give to the pendulum symmetric mode one and symmetric mode two, I can understand the evolution for this initial condition purely in terms of the evolution of the symmetric and the anti-symmetric mode. So this is a technique for interpreting the solution in terms of individual components where the oscillation is happening where the entire object moves in the same frequency. See, if you, if you, if you ask this question that I have this pendulum which is connected with a spring and this is my initial uh, condition. Now, if I go ahead and try to actually uh, analyze this motion, there is no necessary uh, criteria which tells me that, uh, let's say the motion of this guy, I mean, this pen pendulum one and the pendulum two would happen with the same frequency. There is no need for that. Pendulum one might do its own thing. Pendulum two would do its own thing, obviously uh, aware of the fact that there is a spring in between. Now, if you are able to identify these building blocks, so these are your Lego building blocks that you have. And if you can identify these building blocks which move with the same frequency, 
they're not rigid they're not rigid motion see symmetric mode the symmetric mode, uh, mode is a rigid motion where it's where the spring does not undergo any uh, uh, stretching or compression the anti symmetric mode is definitely where the spring is being stretched and compressed so it's not like a rigid body but the entire structure is oscillating with the same frequency so the criteria is that if i can under under identify this underlying building blocks which have the same frequency of oscillation which is root g by l for this and uh, omega not square plus 2 omega c square so if i can identify these uh, individual building blocks which move with the same frequency then that makes my job significantly easier because i can have some irregular initial condition and i don't need to bother about how that irregular initial condition is going to evolve in time i can just say let me initially break this irregular initial condition in terms of this building blocks and i have a very good understanding of how each building block actually evolves i know here the symmetric modes evolution i know the anti symmetric modes evolution i'm quite aware of how they behave so whatever initial condition you throw at me i'm going to basically come back at you saying that okay it's it's 10% of the symmetric mode and 90% of the anti symmetric mode let's just choose some random numbers so since the evolution of these modes are predetermined then you just need to multiply the evolution of the symmetric mode and with the initial condition that projection of the initial condition and the anti symmetric mode with this corresponding projection of initial condition and you are done you don't need to really for a, for every calculation you don't need to go back and redo it the only thing you need to do is you need to figure out how is the initial condition projected on the these structures that are there these building blocks which are there and these are the ones which are called as normal modes so the idea of normal modes is that for any system which has oscillation this is nothing special about fluid mechanics this is nothing special about solid mechanics this is a general idea of vibration a general idea of a system undergoing oscillations so if you have a system which is undergoing oscillations you ask the question can i identify so if i have n degrees of freedom can i identify this n degrees of motion where the object oscillates or moves with the same time period of frequency if you are able to do it that helps you understand the motion in a very simple manner you don't need to always redo the calculation if somebody gives you a completely different initial condition and that's the advantage that's the notion of normal modes and that's also why it's advantageous to do it that you don't really try to probe the system for different different initial conditions you probe the system to find out its normal modes and once you have found the normal modes then your job pretty much gets taken care of so that's a key a key idea that you are going to multiple degrees of freedom and you are analyzing what those normal modes are now if you go to higher degree of freedom we spoke about what happens in the linear case so if you have the non linear cases also being included then the system can actually go out of those nice oscillations and you can see more complicated non linear pattern happening so this is a case where you have two rods which are connected this is a hinge that's there so there are two degrees of freedom and uh, if you do small uh, amplitude oscillation then you will be describing pure them based on the analysis that we did so here you can give what kind of deformation you want to the top member and the bottom member now here if you see if you give a very large deformation so this is an extremely large deformation or large displacement being given you can see a, an extremely erratic behavior that comes about and this is what happens because uh with this number of degrees of freedom with the non linearity so this remarkable. system the double pendulum can be a chaotic uh, system so this is a manifestation of the non linearity now these were for fewer degrees of system now what happened when i have a continuous system a continuous system by definition is an infinite dimensional system so if i have a continuous system this idea of normal mode still continues to exist just that the number of normal modes because you have infinite degrees of uh, freedom will turn out to be infinite in number 
So if I have a stringed instrument, so let me not try to draw here. So if I have a a, a stringed instrument. So for a stringed instrument, uh, if you pluck, this is whether it's a, a guitar or a violin, anything which is actually has a string which is used to generate sound. If you pluck the, the string, it will undergo an oscillatory motion. Now you can ask the question that uh, what is the underlying building block for this system? So are there, are there motions for this uh, stringed object where it actually behaves with the same frequency? And the answer is yes. So you have such a system. So here the equation that you are actually going to solve would be an equation for the oscillation of a string or a vibration equation. So without explicitly solving the equation, I'm just showing you the shapes that you would get. So you would find in one case, it's like a half a sine wave. The next case where you have the full sine wave, then you gradually start accommodating more number of crest and troughs. So you have the fundamental and then you have the different overtones in the problem. And for each case, you notice certain features. One feature you should notice is obviously that the entire object is moving with the same frequency. The other one is that the locations of zero displacement continues to remain so for all time. So I have marked it in the second case. And you can see I've marked a dot there. The dot doesn't really go out of the string. Similarly, if, if I try it out here, there are these two locations on the string which have zero displacement and they are going to remain so for all time. So that gives you unique locations for vibrating shapes where there are no displacement. So those will be the nodes of the system. Now this is a one dimensional continuous system. So it's, it's, it has infinite degrees of freedom, but the spatial dimensionality is one. Now what you will see here is the uh, what you see next uh, seems the video is is the video ah, okay it's a little there's a little lag on the video Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. It's fine now. Oh, sorry about that interruption. So, uh, what you saw previously, uh, was this previous uh, string thing visible to everyone? Or the video got interrupted there itself? The string was visible, yeah. The string, yeah. 
okay fine so before uh, so that that was basically the case of uh, a one dimensional continuous system and what the vibrating shapes look like and uh, there was just a question for uh, you guys to think about um, this is a uh, slightly uh, beyond the scope of what we are discussing that what would happen to the shapes if one of the end of the string was free so you have one end tethered and the other end is free what would happen to this vibrating shape so you can think about this uh, that actually has an interesting connection to what happens in fluid mechanics so the next thing i wanted to show was uh, the vibrating shapes when you have uh, once again a continuous system but of dimen spatial dimensionality too so this is a plate so you have plates of different uh, shapes uh, the gentleman there is sprinkling uh, sand on those plates and as you keep uh, playing the plate this quote unquote playing the plate with a bow uh, you see nice patterns appearing on the plate and uh, he's using his finger to actually create a boundary condition so you say that that location of the plate is either clamped uh, or hinged you use your finger to if you if you are if you have that degree of dexterity and precision you can use your finger to create a certain boundary condition but the more important point is you see these vibrating shapes which are coming up and then there are these uh, specific locations where all the sand goes and resides and that those locations are the nodes of the problem so it has a vibrating shape and with the shape that you are observing is the normal mode so you are visualizing the normal mode for the sound it creates so this is often uh, this is called the khaldini plate and uh, this is an, a, a way of actually uh, looking at it or visually perceiving uh, what a sound looks like so you have the sound and with that there is an associated a pattern that comes about and the pattern is the normal mode and the nodes are the location where the sand is going and residing and this you can obviously play around with the geometry you can play around with the plate shape uh, imperfections if you wish to i mean there's enough resource that you would find uh, on youtube on these uh, kaldini plates so that's something which is quite interesting so uh, if you say that i have these method of normal modes and i'm looking at the continuous system harmonics uh you can take a 2d sheet so this is like doing the previous uh video that we had uh you now consider let's say a 2d membrane and you ask the question that uh, what are the analogous vibrating shapes so for the string you had those uh uh you had a, a single hum sign you had a full sign you had something like this you had different different sign curves right and uh, you can ask the same question that what would be those corresponding for a cylindrical sheet what's the analog for going from a single plane a single string to a 2d uh, circular membrane now it turns out again here you can solve for the vibrating shapes you can solve for the vibration problem and it would come about in terms of not sign functions but something slightly more complicated or rather the extension of sines and cosines to polar geometry they would be in terms of bessel functions so that's okay i mean you have something slightly more complicated that doesn't sound like uh, something physically uh, terribly insightful it's just a mathematical function which is because of the new geometry that you have but there's something slightly more interesting uh, than uh, just the fact that you don't have sines and cosines so in the previous problem when you had these sine functions the frequency of oscillation of each mode were multiples of the fundamental so if you found out what was the frequency for the second mode it would be a multiple of the fundamental the third mode would be a multiple so all the overtones would have a frequency that's a multiple of the fundamental now for the vibrating uh, drum or the vibrating sheet the bessel function does not have that kind of zeros like the sines have so the consequence is that the ratio of frequency is not integer and this non integral multiple or non integral ratio between the 
overtones and fundamental or if in this case if you take the ratio of frequency between two consecutive sine functions it would be a rational function whereas in the case of the cylindrical problem it turns out that's not the case so this non integral behavior actually leads to what we call as harmonicity so they are not really harmonic the frequency since they are not integral multiples of each other they turn out to be anharmonic and this is something which was uh, quite interesting in the context of percussion instruments that if you just think of a sheet a circular sheet stretched on top of a drum the frequencies that you are going to get would be anharmonic so they would not have the uh, musical nature as that would come from the classical indian percussion instrument which is the tabla and interestingly obviously the design of tabla predates our knowledge of vibration oscillations normal mode etc the design of the tabla is such that the frequencies are exactly integral multiple of each other and this comes about primarily because of that black patch that you see in the center so there's a black paste which is usually put in the center which makes the cross section non uniform it's not a uniform thickness sheet the sheet has non uniform thickness and because of that non uniformity you actually manage to get the or you are able to tune the non uniformity to get the harmonicity in the frequency and if you note, look at the uh, uh, the image on the side this is a paper from 1920 written by cv raman so he was one of the uh, first person who actually uh, approached this problem from the uh, theory of vibrations then why is an indian percussion instrument have harmonic uh, frequencies and there are several uh, more literature that you would find trying to actually uh, do this in a more rigorous manner so that's basically the background uh, for normal modes uh, why normal modes in what context of oscillations fluid flows uh, they become important and now we are going to see them in the context of uh, a fluid flow so we saw this in the purely in the context of uh, the vibration problems the classical pendulum so we start with the pendulum problem then we go to the string problem then we go to a more complicated plate or sheet problem so we have gradually understood that we can take a preliminary vibration of a single degree of freedom take it to higher degrees of freedom extend it to more numbers of spatial dimension and the fundamental idea remains the same so here i will take a small break and i will take questions uh before we move to the fluid flow uh, aspect so uh anand has a question if you want you can also unmute yourself and ask the question i'll just take the first question i see in the chat box uh how do we know if a mode is a normal mode so our approach for finding a normal mode is that uh you check for the mode shape so for instance um, let's say this uh, the vibrating sheet problem so you look for when you are searching for the solution you are searching for them to actually have the same frequency of oscillation so the mode shape would change in uh, in i mean it's it's not a uh, it would have a certain spatial variation but the entire thing would have the same frequency of oscillation so we will actually now see that how do you solve it mathematically like how do i actually solve for normal modes mathematically but the physical idea is that normal modes would be those vibrating forms or vibrating shapes of any problem which have the same frequency of oscillation where the entire structure is moving where i'm using the word structure uh, in a loose manner it's not always a problem of a structural vibration we are obviously talking about a fluid mechanics problem so you can imagine all the fluid particles are uh, propagating in time with the same frequency so that would be your uh, definition for a normal mode and we will uh, work it out vishnu has a question uh, does all normal modes have same frequency no they will not have the same frequency in some cases frequencies can be coincident and we will again uh, will not really uh, uh look at such specific cases but 
in general they will the frequencies will be distinct they will uh, not be coincident uh, hi anbu uh, yeah hi so uh, in the con in the spirit of for example this norman mode analysis itself one can say that uh, instabilities are sort of exponentially growing in some sense right but when 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 you show those pictures of i guess the initial pictures where you can see that those instable unstable patterns are sustained in time uh, in some sense right so how does one think about that from a normal mode analysis perspective that they should be exponentially growing and hence you should not be able to see them sustained for a long period of time right so absolutely can, yeah so how can one understand that from that perspective yes so uh, when we are searching for these normal modes and again this will uh, when we look at the fluid mechanics equation it becomes uh, clearer that the uh system is basically being linearized and then we ask for the normal modes for the linear problem so if we happen to find the system actually uh experiencing a growth so yeah. i will say that there is a normal mode and uh, the normal mode predicts an exponential instability or an exponential growth that's in the context of the linear problem no obviously to arrive at the linear problem i would have ignored certain terms and said that hey this these non linear terms are insignificant and i'm dropping them yeah so once things start to grow exponentially fast at some point that assumption becomes invalid and we would then need to bring in those terms and obviously the system will then transition to something completely else which you see in the picture where an exponential growth is no longer happening the exponential okay. growth is what you are trying to predict in the initial stage So from the context of the, the full yeah got it, got it. from the non linear the non linearity is what uh, tends to make those patterns sustain in some sense right exactly so uh, there would be some kind of an arrest or saturation that the non linearities would bring in uh, you would be you would say that okay i mean the in the rele banard problem you would see those nice convection patterns yeah. they can't be predicted using the linear theory they yeah. come from the non linear analysis the linear theory will say that that induction profile cannot be sustained and there is going to be an exponential growth in all the field parameters in the problem velocity pressure etc whatever signal you are measuring they are going to grow exponentially in time but then uh -huh. uh, in the actual problem linearity is only for a certain time window because i mean the real problem does not make a distinction between linear or non linear it so happens that if your disturbances if you have introduced they are very small in magnitude the system will go through a sequence where there is an initial linear instability and then subsequently it enters into a non linear regime where different things could happen i mean there could be a normal mode in that non linear state itself but my point is that the exponential growth you observe that invariably gets cut off due to non linearity so, so uh, an additional question to mm -hmm. that like for example the traditional definition used for instability in the linear theory has something to do with the growth in some sense right of that correct Yes, particular mode. The growth is exponential, but for non-linear is concerned, I guess you didn't. You don't need the the mode to grow in some any sense. Uh, how do you define, for example, a non-linear instability? So okay, a uh, good question. So see, the non-linear instability could be uh, one could be that you take the non-linear solution as your new base state. Let's say you are unaware. that there was some so for instance if i go to the taylor cuvet problem i'll try to sketch here without disrupting the slides so i have a a homogeneous state so i'm just drawing the outer cylinder if i'm visualizing the outer cylinder i have a homogeneous state then it undergoes a linear stability and this breaks down into a concentric donut shape so you will actually have flow profiles which will look like a donut or a vada okay then after this these toroidal flow patterns subsequently undergo an instability where now the toroidal flow patterns would becomes wavy so going from here to here you can imagine that you are doing a stability analysis of this base state and you were completely unaware that there was a homogeneous flow to start with oh, okay so there's a new base That's state one itself. approach so you can ask the question that if i take the uh, new nonlinear state and do its stability 
does it actually go to something else so there can be so th these are not unique path there are other paths of approaching it so one path is where it goes through the sequence of instabilities first the homogeneous structure basically becomes this kind of toroidal shapes then the toroidal shape basically breaks into more wavy kind of vortices and gradually you will see more like a barbed wire kind of like if you think of that the flow pattern looks like a barbed wire kind of a fence pattern and then finally it goes into a full turbulent state i'm just giving a a very crude idea of how the uh, sequence goes but finally the uh, sequence that we are uh, talking about here i mean when you are doing the linear stability you can pretty much do a linear stability of the nonlinear state provided you know that this is another uh, laminar state that you have arrived at okay and these arrows in some sense signify the uh, parameter uh, space that you are changing uh, over time yeah so you keep changing the rotation rate let's say that you keep taking Correct. the deliquet problem you keep changing the inner cylinder rotation rate as you keep changing Uh, at the critical Taylor Reynolds number, which in signifies linear stability, you will see the uh, flow become unstable, and then in the non-linear state, you will see these nice. Uh, because the moment it becomes uh, linearly unstable, or rather, when the linear instability has set in, you would not necessarily see any pattern coming in. The pattern comes in because of non-linear. Okay. And once the non-linearity comes in, then that could sustain for a period of time, and after that, that could sub subsequently become unstable. I see. And that but would only is, happen if you change the parameter, mm, right? Yes. If you're but this is one. But, yeah, but this is one path. This is not the path of uh, the sequence of instability. There could be many other things which could happen. So the only thing you can say for certainty is that if there is a linear instability, the system would not adhere to the first state that you have started out with, and then based on the nonlinearity and other physics, I mean, primarily nonlinearity will lead to some kind of saturation. That's that's by far what would happen okay so uh, there is one question uh, does the chamber of the tabla affect the frequency and the amplitude of the sound wave so the answer is yes definitely so the vibrating pattern that i'm showing here this is a purely uh, two dimensional uh, pattern i mean it's a two dimensional thing but if you do the full uh, 3d problem where you have a cylinder with a flat base with a top surface that is actually flexible yes it would but finally uh, the anharmonicity or rather bringing it to the harmonic nature comes about because of the varying uh, thickness so i mean you can take that reference uh, rahul siddharthan's article from 1997 is i think in american journal of physics if i am not mistaken uh, it's very gives a nice description of what uh, is the source and you will probably find more uh, follow up article because there are enough physicists who have looked into this problem of indian percussion instruments and their harmonicity that what makes it so if you think for a layman if you think in terms of the musical quality that harmonic nature actually comes because uh, it's not a perfect 2d sheet okay aditya is asking in case of chaotic flow how will we uh, identify modes um i don't know uh if there is a way to do it uh because once the system becomes chaotic by definition it's going to have a whole spectrum of frequencies so it can be in a state before chaos where there are uh multiple frequencies in the system which are nonlinearly interacting uh you can still make an attempt to identify some modes mode like uh behavior by saying these are the dominant frequencies in the system but if it has gone to a chaotic state then inherently it has a wide range of time scales i mean the frequency if you look at the uh, spectrum of frequencies it will be sufficiently broadband so it may not be possible to actually identify uh, modes in such a case i mean that's what i would take a guess uh are normal modes same as natural modes uh, i don't know uh what natural modes are uh, if in fluid mechanics traditionally we talk about normal modes uh if the natural modes are also uh used uh in the context of fluid mechanics but i mean if it's used with the same uh, meaning as the entire thing moving with the same frequency then yes they will be deepak is there something else uh, you had in mind regarding natural modes
Okay. Uh, any other question regarding this part? Do interrupt. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, not all of you, I mean, even if you have seen this before, if there's something which strikes you right now when you're looking at it, uh, feel free to interrupt. You don't need for this part. Uh, since fluid system laminar are more similar to a sheet, uh, uh, can we say we can observe Bessel waves than harmonics? Yes, absolutely. So Vishnu, um, let me quickly try to go to So Vishnu has a question that uh, uh, would you see these Bessel waves also in fluid mechanics and what you see on the bottom left, these are actually, uh, this is the analogous problem of the tabla or the vibrating sheet. So you have a surface of water. Uh, there, what elasticity plays a role. Here it's uh, surface tension. So the fluid molecules which are there uh, on the water surface they experience unequal amounts of attraction from its neighbor deep inside the water and the air. So that leads to surface tension. So because of that restoring mechanism of surface tension, uh, you perturb the system and the system basically undergoes oscillation. And uh, you can do planar oscillations, which we will discuss uh, in the evening. Those will be like signs and costs. Or you can also do axisymmetric oscillations, which will be in terms of Bessel functions. Any other question regarding this part? Okay, uh, so we now go on to taking these normal modes and looking at fluid flows. So we have so far hopefully convinced you that there is some merit in studying normal modes. Um, it's not entirely uh, just making some substitution because often when we see normal modes, uh, we think, okay, I have a differential equation. I make a substitution of uh, form exponential of i omega t or exponential of i k x minus c t, something of that sort. And I don't really think, uh, why is it being done? And hopefully after this initial uh, introduction through vibrating shapes, you have uh, some uh, idea that why we are looking for this kind of a solution, that we are looking for building blocks or vibrating building blocks which have the same frequency of oscillation. So that makes understanding the response of a system, the linear response of a system, uh, significantly easier. So now if I have to do stability of fluid flows, there are a bunch of different problems where uh, you can ask the same question. That is the flow stable to disturbances. You can have a channel flow, which is, I mean, these are traditionally flows that you would have encountered in a fluid mechanics course where there are two plates, pressure-driven flow creates a parabolic velocity profile. There can be the same setting in an axisymmetric geometry, which is a pipe flow. Uh, you have, once again, a parabolic velocity profile. You can have a vertical flow where uh, there is, again, an axisymmetric flow, but the velocity field is unlike in the pipe flow where it is axisymmetric and it is along the axis of symmetry, in the vertical flow, the flow is in the plane normal to the axis of symmetry. So if I define an axis of symmetry, there is an azimuthal flow. So that's my vertical flow. Now you can have different kinds of azimuthal flow pattern. Now, the cartoon that I've drawn here, this is for the case where there is a core that is moving like a rigid body and the exterior is a rotation. So the velocity field inside goes linearly with position, radial position, and the velocity field outside goes inversely. Inversely with the position. So this is, you don't need to take this for a vortex. You can have a more general velocity profile, but I'm just giving you an example. And this would be a time model for a vortex. Then uh, you can have a boundary layer profile. So it looks similar to the channel flow with the key difference that uh, the flow profile is changing along the X coordinate. So in the channel flow, we say that this is the 
we say this is fully developed and that essentially implies that the flow does not vary in the direction of the motion whereas in the boundary layer flow the flow is actually varying along the direction of motion so in that sense it's not invariant in the flow direction and then you can have more complicated flow pattern so this is a flow past a swept wing where uh, the flow has a variation in more than two coordinates so you, you if you look at the flow pattern the flow pattern actually has a variation along y as well as the uh, x and z direction so it's a more complicated a uh, flow pattern that you have now if you have to ask the question that how do you go about searching for normal modes in this problem if i have to do a normal mode analysis what would be my approach for doing this so the simplest answer is if you take this flow and you say that i'm introducing disturbances in this system and i want to search for normal modes you introduce fourier modes in directions in which the flow is invariant which means the direction in which the flow does not vary so in the channel flow direction if i consider a two dimensional uh, setup the flow does not vary in the x direction the flow is also not varying in time so i'll assume that any disturbance i'm introducing in the system that's going to be some unknown function of y but some sinusoidal i mean here exponential of i k x x minus omega t is used for the convenience of uh, doing an algebra and also bringing in analogy to a fourier transform but you can think of that previously when we solved solve the problem for the string problem we said that there is going to be a, a mode which has a sin x kind of a behavior so in the same way here in the direction in which the flow is invariant you are going to assume a fourier mode so in the case for the pipe flow the flow varies in the radial direction but the flow does not vary along the axial direction neither does it vary along the azimuthal direction and obviously the flow is steady so you could choose the mode that you are searching to be some unknown function of r and a fourier form in z theta and t and similarly for the vortex also the same applies true that you have no variation along the z direction the axial direction no variation along the axis of symmetry and obviously it's a steady flow so you can assume the flow the disturbances you are searching for to be some function of r and with a sinusoidal variation that you were searching in the direction of z theta and t now what would happen if you would have also assumed a variation along the radial direction sinusoidal or even to make it simpler for the channel flow problem you can say okay i don't want to deal with a cylindrical geometry let me just ask look at it for the planar geometry for the channel flow problem what would happen if i would have assumed this solution to be e to the power i k x x plus k y y minus omega t so there are two issues here and one issue you will see when we write down the equation that's a mathematical issue so i'll explain it when we write down the equation the other is a more physical uh, point of view if i say there is a kx kx denotes the wave number along the x direction so i'm saying that there is a wave that i have introduced which has a certain wave length the wave length is 2 pi by kx now if you say that i introduce an exact sine wave form in the vertical direction what is the meaning of the wavelength in the vertical direction what does 2 pi by ky mean in the vertical direction the reason i am asking this is in the vertical direction the flow itself is varying so if the flow itself is varying in the wall normal direction in the y direction what does it mean to actually look for a wave that has a certain sinusoidal variation in that direction there is no way to interpret that sinusoidal variation on a varying background 
So we don't make that a priori assumption. We don't start out by saying, okay, in the y direction also, it should be a Fourier mode. In the y direction also, it should be a sine or a cosine. We don't say that. We don't say that because in that particular direction, the flow itself is changing. And because the flow itself is changing in that direction, there is no a priori reason to actually make a distinction of the... So if you say that I make measurements of the disturbance and I identify a wavelength. Now here, in the x direction, I can do that. I can place two sensors separated by a certain distance. And based on the fluctuations I measure, I can get a sense for what the wavelength is. Because the background flow is not varying in the x direction. So if I make measurements of certain variations occurring in the x direction, that's purely going to describe the spatial variation of the disturbance. Because the background flow is invariant. Which is why I can actually ask the question that let me assume a Fourier mode in that direction. Now in the wall normal direction, in the y direction, if I do that same exercise and I measure a difference, that difference is due to a coupled effect of the disturbance varying as well as the background flow varying. So I will not be able to get a clean measurement of the wavelength of variation in that direction. So that's the reason why we don't a priori say what the mode structure is in a direction in which the flow varies. And that's exactly what happens also in the pipe flow and the vortex problem. We don't say a priori what the variation is in the radial direction because the flow varies in the radial direction. So we let that be an undetermined quantity. Is this point clear regarding the fact why we are assuming a certain kind of structure in some directions and not the same in directions in which the flow varies? And this will automatically tell you that if you now do a boundary layer, stability of a boundary layer, we can't assume a Fourier mode in the x direction because the flow varies in the x direction. We can obviously not do it in the y direction. We can do it in T because if you do a steady boundary layer, you can assume that the variation in T can be of the form e to the power i omega T. But I cannot say it's of the form e to the power i k x x. So we can say e to the power minus i omega T, but I will not be able to choose a form of this kind. But then, obviously, uh, you can use the argument that the variation along the boundary layer in the x direction, in the streamwise variation, that's the, that's the definition of boundary layer. The, the streamwise variation is always very slow. So if the streamwise variation is sufficiently slow, you can assume, let me just, yeah. So what you can do is you can say that, let's assume a wave-like variation in the x direction, but the wave number is also slowly varying. It's not a constant because of the fact that the boundary layer actually has a slow variation in the flow direction. Yes, Aritro. You have a question? Sir, uh, what hmm. is the T that we are talking about? Is it uh, for the boundary layer? Is it because it's not developed yet? Or like, uh, as is that the progress variable we are talking about? The T here? Yes, sir. T is the time. So the boundary layer is a steady boundary layer. So I can assume I e to the power I, uh, e to the power minus I omega T. Yes, sir. But uh, what I'm saying is that I cannot do a I K X uh, the way I was doing it for a channel flow because the boundary layer is varying in the x direction. Okay, so Does that make sense? Okay, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. See, previously for the channel flow, we said that it is some function of y into e to the power i k x minus omega t because mm -hmm. in a channel flow, the flow does not vary along the uh, flow direction, along the x coordinate. But in the boundary layer, it varies. So I just gave you a rational that uh, you should not be using a Fourier mode. You should not be assuming a sinusoidal variation along directions in which the flow varies. 
So now I'm giving you a, a way to just slightly uh, uh, relax that argument for flows like a boundary layer, where there is a slow variation of the base state. Boundary layer does not have the same kind of variation in the y direction as it has in the x direction. Yes. Sir. If that would have happened, then I couldn't have made any assumption regarding. Uh, so if the boundary layer was rapidly varying in x, I mean it would not be a boundary layer then. But if there was a flow which was rapidly varying in x and y, then it would be some function of x comma y into the power minus i minus i omega t. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But because the boundary layer has this has this property which we know where variations in vertical directions are more rapid than in the flow direction, you can make a relaxation and assume this kind of a uh, quasi. So I mean, it's called a, a non-parallel assumption that the flow is not fully developed, Transition but the variation not, is. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sir. So this is again something which uh, people have looked at extensively in the context of boundary layer and even so any flow which is uh, has this kind of a slow variation then uh, you can do this approach. Now obviously for the other case I just for the third case it's going to be purely a function of x and y. Ah, so Vishnu, good question. So Vishnu had a question. Let me see. Ah, so the question Vishnu had was, if we are already assuming uh, f of x comma y, why do we make the assumption that kx is a function of x? So what you are trying to do here is that uh, you can obviously say it is some f of x comma y to the power minus i omega t. So you could have done, yeah, you could have done that, that it is some function of x comma y to the minus i omega t. But since the flow has a slow variation in that direction, what you are saying that there is some merit in looking for some uh, wave-like variation in the x direction. You can't completely discount that. There is, there is some merit in searching for that. So you are saying that the waves that you are looking at are varying on a length scale which is much faster than the variation of the background flow. So the f of x comma y actually captures the slow variation of the boundary layer and the e to the power i k x x that actually captures the slow variation that is occurring for the waves in local regions of the boundary layer. So you are trying to separate out the slow and the fast variation. You say that the boundary layer is varying slowly and I can search for waves whose spatial variations are not as extensive or as large scale as the variation of the boundary layer. So then you try to make the separation. You account for the slow variation of the boundary layer and you account for the fact that the waves could possibly be. So you can have waves which are varying on a scale that is much smaller than the variation of boundary layer. And then you try to use this kind of an uh, approach where you still search for a Fourier mode but you say that the wave number will not remain a constant because when it goes to the next station further downstream, the flow would have changed. Hence the wave number corresponding there would be different. So you allow for that slow variation of the wave number also. So this is just to make, uh, make that kind of a distinction of a slow and a fast variation. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. So Anand has a question that if the flow is unsteady and varies in all three dimensions, can we not assume a Fourier form at all? Absolutely. So if you have a flow that's, uh, I mean, a full three-dimensional flow and is unsteady, then you can't really assume anything about uh, a normal mode form. You can do a linear stability calculation. So effectively, you will solving the linearized equations. But yes, you can't, uh, in that case, make any such assumptions you would have to go ahead and do it in a full uh, numerical manner. So for instance, uh, this is not quite there in terms of what you had in mind, but here the flow varies in X as well as Y. So you, you have the liberty of assuming a variation in time and the Z direction. But if this was an unsteady problem, then the time also would have gone away. And obviously, uh, if you take away the Z variation, then you can't do this kind of a Fourier mode. So, there are several settings where uh, you will not be then choosing uh, a Fourier mode like this. 
Yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. I hope I'm audible. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the growth of the perturbations will be governed by the uh, the perturbation equations, the linearized perturbation equations, right? So uh, perturbation can be provided in um, in any direction, even in in the directions where the base flow varies. And uh, the growth is anyway going to be governed by uh, the uh, the perturbation equations. So how does it matter if the flow is invariant in a certain direction? Uh, and how does the form of the perturbation matter? We can we can provide different forms of perturbation as well. Absolutely. As long as it's so, small, uh, it should be valid. Absolutely. So the point is, this is for our benefit of uh, understanding how the perturbations evolve. So in a in a in a problem, if you say that uh, whether the flow varies in a particular direction or not. uh if i just add disturbances and uh, the disturbances are introduced in some arbitrary manner and i and i try to actually understand how the disturbances evolve uh the disturbance uh, the evolution of the disturbance you can study that evolution without actually trying to search for whether these directions are invariants or not so what we are saying is that if you are able to do this kind of a normal mode analysis if you are able to identify if the system actually has not all systems will have it if if the system actually has a uh, certain such elementary pieces which are moving in the same manner in time your calculation becomes significantly simpler so for instance giving an example let's say for this channel flow uh if you do this calculation you can do it for different range of initial conditions you can give a very concentrated source of vorticity you can give a more distributed uh, form of pressure disturbances you can probably give like some kind of a velocity impulse at some location you can do a whole kinds of different exercise in how you push the system out of its initial state now the idea is that you don't want to do the calculation every time you choose to uh, change your approach of perturbing the system so if the system permits a normal mode analysis then if you have found the normal modes and if you have ended up finding so the idea is that if you have obtained some of these modes indicating an instability you have pretty much done everything you have pretty much okay. covered the whole space of all possible initial conditions you don't need to redo the calculation every time okay yeah now this obviously comes with some caveats and that's that's going to be there uh, after we just focus on this so your question is uh, has a a strong merit maybe few slides down after this where we ask the question that let's say we do all this modal calculations let's say we do all these normal modes and we end up finding the system to be stable to all perturbations mm -hmm. so then the question that you are asking becomes very pertinent that i don't okay. care about all of these uh, business of searching for invariant direction etc my question is i give some initial kick to the system is that kick actually going to take it out of the uh, initial uh, state that i have and in some okay. cases the normal modes would not be able to answer that question even though you have normal modes they are incapable of answering that question so it's it has uh, i mean it leads into that direction so we'll come in that uh, okay. form thanks yeah so now uh, we need to see how these equations are actually worked out how do we uh, get these equations so we take our governing equation i've written down the non dimensional navier stokes equation you can use the center line velocity the channel width uh, the viscosity of the fluid to construct a reynolds number uh, this is an incompressible system so the fluid is divergence free now if you add some fluctuation to the system you are saying that hey i have some base state i have some background uh, state and i'm perturbing the background state and the same thing i do for all other variables now here the only relevant variables are the three components of velocity and pressure so you make the assumption that the disturbances that you have introduced they are infinitesimally small in amplitude than the background actually what should be infinitesimally small is epsilon times u uh, it's the entire thing which is infinitesimally small uh then the background that you have so that's the uh, premise of linearization that you are going to look at disturbances whose magnitude from the point of view of analysis always remains significantly small compared to whatever is the magnitude for the background flow so you can do this exercise and write down a linearized navier stokes equation 
So this equation, the only thing that you have done that you have said that the base state also satisfies Navier-Stokes equation. So you subtract the equation governing the base state from the full equation and you get an evolution equation for the perturbation. And you drop terms which are nonlinear in perturbation. So you get a nonlinear equation Navier-Stokes which gets reduced to a linear Navier-Stokes equation for the perturbation. So now uh, this is what we need to solve. And uh, just in the context of the previous question we had, you can not bother about normal modes and you can go ahead and solve this because that U bar, the background base state is given to you. You know that background base state. And you can see one important feature here that the material uh, derivative, the advective nonlinearity in the material derivative, U dot del U, that term actually gives you something fairly non-trivial in your stability equation. So if you contrast this to several other stability problems that uh, people do outside fluid mechanics, in most cases, uh, if there is no such nonlinearity in the system, then the talking between the base state, the fact that the base state and the perturbation are talking to each other, it's a one-way communication from the point of view of the linear theory, where the base state only communicates with the perturbation, not vice versa. You find that uh, there is a strong coupling term like this. Now you can solve this using uh, the, you can actually solve this uh, basically using numerical calculation, uh, Laplace transform, or you can use method of normal modes. Numerical calculation means that you can actually uh, just go ahead and uh, solve this numerically. Don't make any assumption whatsoever. The Laplace transform, approach is where you solve it as an initial value problem in time. You give some initial condition. The other one is using the method of normal modes that we discussed. So we are going to just focus on that. Uh, so the few questions, let me just take them. Uh, one question is any reason for the same epsilon for both U and P perturbation? Something to do with the scaling of U and P. So yeah, so the, even without the scaling, we are just saying that the perturbation in uh, U and P are uh, infinitesimal compared to the base state. So that epsilon is just there to denote the fact that those are uh, in amplitude small quantities. Uh, but you can do a viscous scaling for pressure that would shift the Reynolds number, but it will uh, continue to be infinitesimal to the base state. Vishnu has a question, is the second term in perturbation, uh, is the perturbation communication with base flow? So both the terms, are the influence of the base flow on the perturbation. Because if you look at the evolution equation for the base flow, there is no contribution from perturbation there. So we are doing a one-way communication here. We are not doing a two-way communication. So obviously it, the problem is has a two-way communication where the perturbations then go and do a feedback to the base flow and alter the base flow. Uh, we, are not we are not doing that right now. Right now, we are just looking at the problem where the base flow stays as it is or evolves in its own manner. And uh, you were just asking the question, how would the perturbations uh, talk to, uh, or rather the perturbations get influenced by the base flow? Assuming that the base flow is like this completely invariant thing, which doesn't matter how the perturbation evolves. So, if you now go ahead and assume a normal mode form, so we will do this for the case of a channel flow. Uh, here, just to remind you the notations, I have made the vertical coordinate as Z, uh, unlike the previous case where it was X, uh, Y. Uh, X and Y, X is the flow direction, Y is the vorticity direction for the channel flow. This is, channel flow is just as a representative example. We are not going to solve channel flow, but just for the purpose of derivation, we are choosing a rectilinear flow. So you assume that the velocity and pressure perturbations are functions of the wall normal direction, some unknown function. But uh, in the direction of x, y, and t, we assume a Fourier mode. So if you do all of this, you would get, uh, finally, there's a, there are a few, well, there are a couple of lines of algebra involved in reducing it. So you have three equations for three perturbation velocity component. There is uh, one more equation of continuity. You can use them to eliminate variables. You can eliminate pressure first, and then you can eliminate one more component of velocity. So if you do all of that, uh, you get an evolution equation for the wall normal component of velocity, and you get one more equation, which is the evolution equation for the vorticity uh, component. 
so there is one more vorticity component so in uh, so i'll just take one more question how do you impose the boundary condition for the decomposed mean flow and perturbation flow field okay so i should have mentioned that um so you have the boundary condition on the total flow field if the perturbation um, sorry if the base flow satisfies that boundary condition entirely then the perturbation would have homogeneous uh, boundary condition which means that to put it uh, in simple uh, terms if i have a rigid wall rigid wall problem then the perturbation velocity would continue to be zero at both the walls now this changes and this is again something that you will see in the second half that if you have uh, an a free surface where you perturb the interface it's not a rigid boundary but it's a deformable boundary then uh, the boundary condition on the uh, perturbation velocity field would be non trivial it would not just be a homogeneous boundary condition it turns out to be homogeneous for the rigid boundary where they will just satisfy the no slip no penetration so you have uh, finally a set of equations which is one of them for the velocity the other for a component of vorticity the velocity equation is known as the orsonfeld equation uh, this is the full three dimensional disturbances um and the other one is for the perturbation uh, vorticity which is called the square equation so you have kx and ky as the two wave number and k is the total uh, wave number i'll take one more question here so it says um um okay ha huh. so uh, the question was regarding will you violate the uh, condition of u being much smaller than mean u at the boundary and the answer is yes it will happen if you have uh, so again non linearity is not just in the bulk non linearity can also be at the boundary so if you have the boundary being deformable then you can definitely if you have large deformations occurring at the boundary which would again be in the context of a let's say a liquid liquid interface that large deformation of the boundary can definitely lead to uh, the mean i mean the velocity being comparable or larger than the mean velocity that can definitely happen but if you have a rigid wall and uh, you say that uh, the fluid the base state fluid velocity is equal to whatever is the wall velocity so the base state fluid velocity actually Uh, satisfies the no slip no penetration boundary condition at the wall whether the wall is moving or the wall is at rest the perturbation irrespective of its amplitude will satisfy the homogeneous boundary condition because the walls are not deforming so if the base has taken care of the entire boundary condition then uh, the perturbation would just have to be homogeneous nothing else the difference would come about if the wall was not rigid if it was allowing for deformation so these are my uh, stability equations now if you have to solve this uh, equation you re should realize what are the known quantities and what are the unknown quantities now obviously with the boundary conditions which are there now i have the wave number i have the frequency i have reynolds number and i have the so if i just look at the first equation let's just stare at the first equation the orsonfeld equation there is wave number there is a uh, frequency omega there is reynolds number and then there is the velocity uz now if you fix the parameter in the problem which is reynolds number so let's say you fix the channel reynolds number then the quantities which you still need to evaluate are omega k and uz the background flow is given to you if it's a channel flow it's a parabolic velocity profile so then you are searching for solutions of this equation for omega k and uz basically being the unknown so what you could do is you can specify the wave number so which is kx and ky and then search for those omega which allow user to not only solve the differential equation but satisfy the boundary condition see classically when we solve for boundary value problems we are solving for a differential equation subject to certain boundary condition here the differential equation is subject to certain boundary condition with an unknown parameter in the problem which is omega so i can say that the k is given to me so let's say i have fixed what is kx what is ky and given the kx and ky i'm searching for what would be my omega and then correspondingly what is my uz so this then becomes an eigen value problem 
so if you think of the matrix eigen value problem it's of this kind where you have ax equals omega bx x is an unknown the eigen vector omega is the unknown is the eigen value similarly here you have a differential equation so you can write the differential equation in this form where you can think of x as being uz and a and b involving derivatives and the parameters k renolds etc and omega is an unknown and uz is an unknown subject to the boundary conditions in the problem so when you solve that you get what is called as a dispersion relation this can be analytically found or this in many cases would be numerically found that given the parameter and alls you are trying to work out a relation between omega and k if i supply k what would be the relation for omega so here this is just written in terms if you write it in terms of a two dimensional uh, problem if you go to the 2d problem then uh, you can write uz the vertical component of velocity purely in terms of stream function so you can represent the perturbation in terms of the stream function and if you take the inviscid limit which means that uh, or rather if you consider the i should not say inviscid limit i should say rather if you consider the inviscid problem then you drop the viscous term and you get an equation which is called as the rayleigh equation so if you take the rayleigh equation this can actually because a second order differential equation so there are solutions to both orsonfeld and rayleigh equation orsonfeld equation does not have those many analytical solutions it has fewer and mostly they are, it's solved numerically rayleigh equation since is second order differential equation it can be solved analytically for several cases and uh, some of the more convenient cases are where you consider the approximation to the background flow in terms of some kind of broken profiles broken line profile so you assume the velocity field to actually be in terms of combinations of linear or plug flow and that can be solved easily because you see that this term u double dash for a velocity field that is linear or a velocity field that is uniform goes to zero so the solution becomes uh, fairly uh, simple to work with and we'll be using again this some of these uh, velocity profiles for uh, the second half to actually work out the calculations but this is what uh, we can set about doing now just again a point for you to ponder is that a uh, simple equation uh consider a quiet flow so the top plate is moving bottom plate is at rest it has a velocity field which is u is equal to z can you find a solution to this equation which is satisfying the boundary condition okay vishnu has a good question here he is asking does the inviscid problem mean the base flow is also inviscid uh the answer is no uh not necessary uh and obviously you if you think a bit you will realize that the base flow cannot be inviscid because if you ask the question how is the flow generated how is the channel flow generated how is the uh, quiet flow generated they are generated due to viscous mechanisms you move the plate and due to the motion of the plate you are transferring momentum into the fluid and that leads to a linear velocity profile you apply a pressure gradient and due to the boundary layer forming at the two plate you gen you have the parabolic flow uh, form what you are trying to do here you are searching for evolutions of disturbances which are not governed by viscous effects so the evolution of disturbances happen on a time scale which is much smaller than the viscous diffusion time scale so the time it takes for the disturbance to actually diffuse due to viscosity is much larger than the time scale over which these waves are propagating or undergoing an instability so that is what it implies by saying that i'm doing an inviscid problem for a given base state the base state would in many cases be derived by solving a viscous equation but by doing an inviscid calculation you are looking for propagation of disturbances that have not yet been corrupted by viscosity so we said that the dispersion relation is a function of omega k and renolds so and i said that you fix the wave number and you search for omega now you could do the opposite 
where you can fix so here this there is c written here so c is omega by k and we'll again see that that definition needs some clarification uh, when you have more than one k in the problem so c if i say is omega by k then i can fix omega and search for k so the dispersion relation that we have here i said that let's fix kx if it's a 2d problem and search for omega so the omega is the eigen value i'm searching for it could also be that i fix the frequency and i ask the question what would be the wave number that i'm searching for now in the problem where i'm fixing kx and searching for omega fix kx and you fix it to be real and you find omega and this is complex this is called temporal stability if you fix omega to be real and find k allowing it for it to be complex that would be a spatial stability so there when you say it's e to the power minus omega i omega t we say that let's search for omega and if omega has an imaginary part that could signify a positive imaginary part that could signify the problem undergoing an instability now if i am saying that i am searching for an e to the power i k x and given an omega since i fixed omega and i'm searching for k k is a complex quantity then the imaginary part of k could denote a growth or decay in space so this would be the premise of a spatial stability analysis now if you take what is called as a mixing layer uh, in fluid mechanics when we study that i have two plug flows flowing past each other and i allow for the effects of viscosity to smear out that sharp gradient i get this kind of a velocity profile which is called a mixing layer so it has a almost a uniform flow which then undergoes a variation over a thin region to another uniform flow so if you search and study for the uh, spatial and temporal stability in temporal stability you are going to find what is the imaginary omega given a real k and in spatial stability you are going to search for what is the imaginary k given a real omega and this would be the idea of a temporal and spatial analysis and there is a way by which you can actually relate uh, the in the vicinity when the flow becomes unstable you can relate the spatial stability is answer with the temporal stability answer now there is obviously a uh, a certain uh, nuance in spatial stability which is not there in temporal stability see in temporal stability if i say i have a solution which is exponential of minus i omega t and i write it as omega r plus i omega i t which means is e to the power minus omega real t e to the power omega i t so if i find omega i to be positive that means this quantity is growing in time if i do the same exercise for spatial analysis i write it as e to the power i k r i k i x then this is i k r x e to the power minus k i x so if k i is negative then it is growing in x if k i is positive it is decaying in x but unlike time space does not have a direction of propagation you have a meaning for time the time always moves forward but for space you can have so if you say that ki is negative then it is definitely growing as you move along plus x but it can also be decaying as you are moving along minus x or if ki was positive that means that the signal is actually decaying along plus x while blowing up along minus x now how do you make the distinction how do you decide if the flow has an instability if this kind of a dichotomy exists so then what you do is you ask the question that if i were to create a disturbance in the system the disturbance is actually propagating with the flow 
So would the disturbance as it propagates, was it, would it actually decay? So this becomes then a spatiotemporal problem. That would the disturbance actually decay? Would the disturbance grow? If the disturbance grows, then there can be two such scenarios where a packet, it flows with the background flow and then subsequently is growing. So that's a convective instability. Whereas the other scenario could be where the disturbance is actually growing about a fixed location. So that would be where it is absolutely unstable. So in this particular case, if I draw a, a line at an X location, I would see my signal initially being all quiet. Then I would see some rapid variation and then it would again go all quiet because the growing wave packet has left me. I'm now in the rear of the uh, wave packet. Whereas in this case, I would see this constantly being amplified. So you make that kind of a distinction and these distinctions become important, especially for spatially developing flows. Jets, wakes for these kinds of settings. It's important that you actually analyze the nature of these instability in the spatiotemporal sense. So you allow for both omega and k both to be complex and you ask the question, I am not particularly asking whether fixing real k, what is omega being imaginary or fixing omega, what is k being imaginary. I'm asking allowing for both to be complex. Would a wave packet actually move along a ray? So it's moving along with the or in, a, in a direction while growing in amplitude or it just corrupts the flow everywhere. And that distinction decides what kind of an instability would you see? So I have a question. Yes. Um, so, so like in mixing layers, uh, you can, when you're doing a simulation, you can have both a spatially developing mixing layer or a temporally developing mixing layer. Right? Correct. Like you Correct. have a plus U and minus U in the <laughs> top and bottom. That would be a temporally. Right. Yeah. So does the uh, temporal instability in a temporally developing mixing layer uh, correspond to a spatial instability in the spatially developing mixing layer? Like, can you uh, make a, can you compare these so, two? So uh, even for the same mixing layer, even for the same mixing layer, I mean, so if you mm -hmm. just have, a, let's say, a mixing layer, which was uh, not spatially varying or temporally varying, you have done probably, let's say, a, 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 a spatial analysis and you have obtained this tan hyperbolic kind of a mixing layer, a, a evolving of a mixing layer. You assume it to not vary further in X and you do a temporal and, and spatial analysis. The, anal the, the two, the predictions of the two, you can, you can uh, check whether they're matching only in the case of the marginal uh, stability, when it goes from stable to unstable. Otherwise they would be, I mean, they're giving you different information. And the, uh, the, uh, the problem that you are talking about where you do a temporal mixing layer, where the mixing layer is basically diffusing out in, uh, in time yes, while remaining the same everywhere in X, and the other is a spatially varying mixing layer. I don't think uh, they would particularly, uh, I mean, there's probably not a way to do a one-to-one -one mapping in the problem. That would be my understanding. But at least if you fix the base state and do a temporal and spatial analysis of the same problem, then in mm -hmm. such a circumstance, you can compare uh, how the growth rates are related in the two problem at the location of the marginal stability. Uh, marginal stability is, uh, sorry. I, I... When you are moving from the stable to the unstable thing. So in your parameter space, when you are moving from uh, stable to an unstable uh, state, it is then that uh, uh, at that marginal point, when you are system is now under the onset of an instability, at that mm -hmm. location, if you try to calculate your growth rate, uh, omega i and your uh, ki, the spatial growth rate, you can relate them. Okay. But uh, for the general case, uh, I don't think you'll be able to do a one-to-one -one mapping. Oh, okay, sir. All right, thank you. So there's few more. I'll probably just see uh, else the remaining part will take in the second half. But uh, just this so far has been like uh, praising the modal stability analysis, uh, saying a lot of great things about modal stability analysis. Uh, showing how it is so powerful. Um, I've not shown how these things are done numerically, but 
I mean, that's something which we can discuss if someone is interested. But some of these cases you can solve analytically, some of it you can do numerically, but it has a lot of merit and all. Now, if you take three classical problems, channel flow, pipe flow, quiet flow, and you do a linear stability analysis. For the channel flow, there is a linear instability for the viscous equation or Sommerfeld equation. And that occurs at a Reynolds number of around close to 6,000. 5772 5, is the critical Reynolds number at which the, the problem becomes, uh, the flow becomes un, uh, unstable. The pipe flow is linearly stable for all Reynolds number. And the quiet flow is again linearly stable for all Reynolds number. Incidentally, all these three are linearly stable in the inviscid problem. So if you search for uh, the solution based on Rayleigh's equation, then all these three problems would be linearly stable. If you do the viscous problem, then the channel flow turns out to be unstable and the others continue to remain stable. Now, this is a bizarre observation. The first level bizarre observation is that uh, there is an instability which has come because of viscosity. The channel flow inviscid problem is stable, but the viscous problem is unstable. Well, you can try to actually argue why that is instability, uh, why that happens by saying that the presence of viscosity actually gives rise to new modes that come because of boundary layer, and then uh, vis a vis how that becomes unstable. But uh, other shear flow configurations, you conclude that they are linearly stable, whether you do a viscous or an inviscid analysis. And this is bewildering because all these problems are known to actually show a transition from their perfect laminar state to the next uh, disorderly state at some critical values of Reynolds number. So the question is, what, are, what is it that we are missing out? Why, why does this happen? You do a modal stability analysis and you find that this is uh, clearly stable but uh, the reality does not agree with your modal analysis. So you go back to your equation, you look at your Orson field equation, you look at your square equation, and then you revisit the claim that you made. So I had said initially achievements of hydrodynamic stability theory. Now I'm rephrasing it and I'm saying achievements of modal stability theory, where we have the centerpieces of taylor Kuwait and Rayleigh-Bernard, but somehow we are failing when it comes to shear flows. Even the Blasius boundary layer has an instability like a channel flow, but it again does not quite match with what you would get from an experimental observation. So the question is, why does this happen? What is the uh, source for this? And the answer lies that this is due to my insistence on searching for the behavior of individual eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. So let's see. Uh, okay, maybe I'll just go do the finish this. In other words, it'll be a discontinuity. So we have basically been saying that let me search the solutions of this Orson field problem. And uh, if I find an omega i, if all my omega i's are negative, then the flow is stable. Given a k, if all my omega i's are negative, then the flow will always be stable. Now, this is where the uh, problem comes in. So the background shear that is there in these problems actually lead to something that is uh, fairly non-trivial. And to see what this is, what I will do is, I'll, this is an exercise which, if you want, you can also do it on pen and paper. It's fairly... Uh, pedagogical in terms of it's, it's just a calculation of summing vectors. So if I have two vectors, one vector which is at an angle with the x-axis, so this is my x and y-axis, uh, one has, both the vectors are shrinking in time. So one shrinks with e to the power minus lambda 1t, the other one is actually shrinking as e to the power minus lambda 2t. The initial condition, one is C times the other. And the angle that is there between the vector, which is 2, with the minus x axis is 5. So if I write down... Okay. So 
so i'm just summing vectors i'm not doing anything significantly complicated so if i write down what is the sum of the uh, what is the magnitude of the resultant then the resultant would be exponential of minus lambda 1t minus c exponential of minus lambda 2t cos phi whole square plus c square exponential of minus 2 lambda 2t sin phi so now you can ask the question that this r the resultant does it increase in time or does it decrease in time now obviously the eigen values if this lambda 1 and lambda 2 if these are all negative if the two individually those vectors are shrinking then i know that the resultant should go to zero and the rate at which it goes to zero will also go to zero so r should go to zero for large time there is no ambiguity regarding that point because if these vectors individually shrink to a point they are vanishing then how can the resultant actually not vanish also so that's not under debate the question is that would it be possible for the resultant to actually grow and then decay so for that we need to search for whether dr dt is greater than 0 so if i take this equation and i take a derivative so 2r dr dt is going to be 2 exponential of minus lambda 1t c exponential of minus lambda 2t cos phi minus lambda 1 into the power minus lambda 1t c lambda 2 exponential of minus lambda 2t cos phi plus Minus two lambda two c square exponential of minus two lambda two sine phi, and this should be greater than zero if the resultant increases for some time. So if you do this, uh, if you do this algebra, so I'm referring you to the original source. So you can actually now take this equation. and try to write it in a more compact form so i'm just going to directly uh, skip that step and write in a compact form so let me just make sure i don't make a mistake with the equation so i will get y square minus y 1 plus r cos phi plus r is less than 0 where this quantity y is exponential lambda 2 minus lambda 1 t by c so if i define this new variable y and r as the ratio of the eigen values then the fact that i want dr dt to be positive will reduce to this kind of a quadratic equation so now if i uh, try solving for that quadratic equation and actually search for the solution what i will find is that uh, i should have again let me make sure i get this i should have my cos phi uh, i should have my phi so first up condition i'll get that phi should be less than sin inverse 1 minus r 1 plus r to get a physical answer and then i will find that uh, for there to be a growth the cos phi should be 2 into 1 plus this is again manipulating with that quadratic equation where h is greater than uh h is greater than equal to 0 well not equal to h is greater than 0 and uh, h plus 1 is less than equal to 1 plus r by 2 root r this is just to make sure that the cosine does not exceed plus 1 so if you have this criteria some specific algebraic criteria involving r which is the ratio of lambda 2 by lambda 1 so if you have this particular uh, criteria you will find that there is a possibility of your resultant growing in time and this is what uh, it would look like so if you consider the perfectly orthogonal arrangement where phi is 90 degree then one of the vectors is shrinking the other is also shrinking and the resultant actually nicely shrinks whereas if you start with a highly obtuse arrangement then both the vectors are shrinking but since 
the one along the x axis is shrinking rapidly compared to the one along the y axis you end up actually getting a resultant that is growing in time and then it decays so eventually the system is going to decay so this tells us that our search for the so here the search was for those eigen values lambda 1 lambda 2 in fluid mechanics problems we wrote down which was in terms of those omega i so a search for those eigen values and trying to see if they denote a stability or an instability would tell us what happens when t approaches infinity but they won't really tell us if the system actually goes through an amplification and then becomes stable and this amplification in many cases could be several orders in magnitude enough for the system to actually go into a nonlinear state so even though an individual mode is actually telling you that the system is stable the response of the system can go through this intermediate amplification and then latching on so the whole idea is that if i try to sum up a bunch of exponentials which are decaying the resultant sum is not always guaranteed to be purely decaying this is obviously the case i mean there will be an angle and all involved here but the fact is that if you have for certain configurations they will increase and then decrease and this is exactly what uh, happens for the fluid flow problems so i think i'll i'll stop here um and maybe just take questions from here onwards to okay Mm, so i'll start with uh, vishnu's question uh, so vishnu asked uh, how is shear in those specific problem causes this so this business is uh, called as the non normality of my governing equation non normality basically implying that my eigen functions are not orthogonal to each other what you saw here the obtuse arrangement giving rise to a growth is coming because the vectors are not orthogonal to each other so in the fluid mechanics parlance this would be where the orsonfeld equation is not orthogonal to each other and the source of the non normality actually comes from the shear term so if you take your if you take this equation and you try to find out that what would be the corresponding adjoint of this equation so if you search for the adjoint of this equation because u is a spatial function of u this particular term would lend lead to an adjoint equation where there would be an additional term which would involve u prime the first derivative of u so all these terms these terms are self adjoint terms so it's this term that is sitting here when you try to take the derivative so if you uh try to try to see how you turn this into an adjoint so you transfer the derivative the second derivative here outside the u you would end up creating one term which would be proportional to the shear rate which would make the adjoint if there is a shear in the problem which would make the adjoint and the governing equation not the not the same and this non normality this uh, this fact that the adjoint uh, is not the same as the governing equation leads to the eigen functions being non orthogonal to each other and the non orthogonality of the eigen functions then subsequently leads to the perturbations growing in time before decay they'll eventually decay but there is going to be a growth that will happen intermediately now when i'm talking about the non orthogonality i'm saying the eigen functions are non orthogonal to each other you have to remember that for uh, when we talk about simple vectors when i gave this a uh, toy example of vectors for vectors you just take the simple dot product and check whether they are orthogonal so the angle if it's 90 degree they are orthogonal if the angle is not any multiple of 90 degree then it is not orthogonal but for the velocity field how do you decide whether it's orthogonal so then you would have to say that if i have a, velo a velocity eigen function uz and i have another velocity eigen function let's say uz1 and uz2 corresponding to an eigen value omega1 and omega2 how do i check if they are orthogonal because this is basically a function it's not just a vector with uh some 
scalar numbers de denoting them, three numbers denoting it. So what we would typically do is we would write down some kind of a extension of a dot product for function. So you would probably write uz into, let's say, uz star integrated over dz dx. Now, you can define this with some arbitrary function sitting in the center, which is called as the weight function. And based on the choice of the weight functions, you can make two functions orthogonal to each other. So for instance, a simple example is sine x, cos x, dx integrated over one time period would be zero. Or sine x, sine 2x integrated over one time period would be zero. But if you have sine x, sine 2x, so if I take sine x, sine 2x multiplied with some arbitrary function, x square, it's not guaranteed to be zero. So the weight function is very crucial in deciding whether some functions are orthogonal to each other or not. Now, why, why is this important for fluid mechanics? Because in fluid mechanics, the orthogonality is to be viewed from the point of view of anything that is relevant, that quantity like, let's say, energy. So if the velocity eigenfunctions under the inner product of energy turns out to be non-orthogonal, and that's what leads to the growth. So I'll just pause it here uh, because we will be, yeah, we will be getting back in another two hours. So I don't want, it's already been two and a half hours. So uh, if you want, I mean, the part that I'm, I've still left is on uh, the aspect of non-normality. Uh, I'll not be covering it because the next thing we'll talk about is on the, in the context of waves. But if you want uh, to stick around or if you want to have any questions regarding this, I'll be happy to answer. So I'll just take some questions. Uh, I think uh, Sharath had a question regarding a typo in R square. I think I've erased it. So it's gone right now. I didn't have a sine square there. Arithra uh, had a question. Why, what does it physically mean to have non-normal eigenfunctions? As I said, like... Uh, if you write down what is the expression for kinetic energy. So kinetic energy would be half u square plus v square plus w square. Oh. Yeah. Let's say integrated over the entire volume. So now if you define this purely in terms of uz. And so if I do, let's say a 2D problem, I ignore this. So I have ux and ui or uz and ux. And if I want to purely define this in terms of uz, then the kinetic energy would be some uz, uh, some function of z. It could be just a function or a derivative. That would be my expression for the kinetic energy, purely in terms of uz. So if in this definition, uh, the uz eigenfunctions, the velocity eigenfunctions turn out to be non-orthogonal, then if I'm looking at my kinetic energy, for the purpose of kinetic energy, I would see the kinetic energy actually grow in time. And there's a possibility that it will grow in time and decay. And this is where there was a question earlier that I give some initial conditions and I study them. Why am I caring about all these invariant direction and normal modes? This is where that initial condition becomes important. Because what you give as an initial condition. So, for instance, in the previous problem, what you give as the initial amplitude of one of the vectors, not just the mere angle. It's not sufficient for it to be non-orthogonal, but also what you give as the initial condition that would decide whether it actually grows in time before it decays. So it depends both on having non-orthogonality and having the right kind of initial condition. So which is what becomes important for um, the fluid mechanics problems. Any other question? If the flow has a transient growth and decay, but it reaches a nonlinear state, what is happening? Is it becoming turbulent or coming to some other state? So if it has a transient growth um, and before it decays, it has already gone to a nonlinear state, then the decay is meaningless. So that's the point I'm trying to say here, that if you solve the Orsonfeld equation and you find a decay, you find that the uh, omega i, so going back to where we started all of this discussion, for all the problems, uh, well, let's forget the channel flow, but for the pipe flow and the quiet flow, the omega i's that you are going to calculate for irrespective of what values of K or Reynolds 
they're always going to indicate a damped solution. They will not indicate any kind of growth, which means that based on the modal argument, all disturbances are going to grow. But the sentence that should be said is that all the normal modes in the infinite time limit would be decaying in time. That doesn't imply that the collection of these modes should always decay. So when I view this as a sum of these decaying exponentials, I could actually have the solution growing in time before it latches on to the decay. And that amplification or that growth could take it to a nonlinear state and that subsequent decay that you have observed from the normal modes is irrelevant. It doesn't matter because you're never going to observe it. If you have given the right kind of initial condition, you can trigger the system to the nonlinear state via this growth. Any other question? Uh, hi, uh, Anwar. Yeah. So uh, whether or not you would get such a growth, I think was purely dependent on the nature of the operator, uh, and the kind of parameters you have in the operator. If it has a parameter which is above certain critical number, then you get for certain with certainty you will get a non-normal growth rate. Or so the operator is non-normal or it is does not is not self-adjoint, irrespective of the value of the parameter. So whether Reynolds is large or small, uh, the parameter, the governing uh, stability equation is always uh, non-normal. Now, the amount of growth that you observe would depend on the Reynolds number. Okay. I see. Does it make sense? Because, because for a purely 2D case, I guess, uh, when you do such an exercise, I guess, you can have certain parameters which you can tweak. And then mm -hmm. uh, eventually, you can, uh, at a certain parameter range, you can make this operator enough non-normal or rather the matrix enough non-normal that you can ensure a non-normal growth in that case, irrespective of what initial conditions you have. Right? So the non-normality actually comes from this term. So unless you are considering a flow which does not vary in the x direction, so if you say that kx is equal to zero, uh, in such a circumstance, if a 2D flow with no kx variation, then uh, you can say that the non-normality does not present. But otherwise, the non-normality actually comes from this term. So the non-normality is always there. How much growth you observe, that depends on the choice of your parameter and the initial condition. I see. Yeah, okay. So the operator is uh, non-normal because of this term. Which in this case, yes. Yeah. It is in this case, yes. So it's actually uh, interesting that the problems where we said that modal civility was so remarkably good. Uh, for the Rayleigh Bernard problem, the oh. corresponding stability operator is normal, which means that the eigenfunctions are orthogonal to each other. Yeah. Uh, for the Taylor Kuwait problem, there is a shear. We cannot say it's not a zero shear problem because uh, the velocity varies along the radial direction. But if the gap is narrow enough, then the degree of non normality. So, coming back to what you're probably trying to say, that uh, in the Taylor Kuwait problem, uh, if you have the gap between the two cylinders sufficiently small, then the uh, non-normal term in the equation can be made extremely small. So the signature yeah. of non-normality in a Taylor Kuwait flow in the narrow gap limit uh, becomes negligible and what you observe is the linear instability based on the modal argument. Correct. Questions, any other? Uh, can we find this transient growth by doing a fast and slow time decomposition? So, uh, see, uh, classically, when we think of, uh, uh, of a slow or a fast time decomposition, you are thinking of a single mode and its evolution on a fast and maybe slow time scale. So the uh, transient growth that you are talking about here, that growth is a collective effort from all the decaying modes. So effectively, that growth is not necessarily, I mean, it will not be an exponential growth. So the modal growth will be exponential in time, but the transient growth, which comes from the non-normality, would mostly be an algebraic growth. And it comes due to a collective effort of all the modes. Uh, so what you can say is that the governing uh, linear stability equations that probed on a short time scale would give you the transient growth. 
and when probed in the infinite time limit would give you the modal signatures which is all the modes are decaying in time so even for this problem the channel flow problem even though you get this 5772 you would find significant amount of transient growth even at a low reynolds number lower lower than 5772 because the non normality i mean all these problems are non normal so they don't make any distinction and it turns out as you can see as i was mentioning here that the non normality has nothing to do with viscosity the non normality is there in the inviscid equation also so even the inviscid equation would actually predict a transient growth or a non or, or a uh, non normal growth it's just that viscosity helps to arrest that growth if you don't have non linearity so it's more uh, more genetic in a sense that you don't need the you don't need to invoke the uh, so it becomes easy to explain when you have the viscous equations because you say that i have these modes which are decaying exponentials and i'm looking at a combination of these decaying exponentials which then give me a give me something that is growing in time but uh, the source of the non normality or the source of this transient growth is not just from the viscous equation it is there in your parent inviscid equation you can so what i was um, uh, i mean i skipped over because this would go into a little more detail and we'll probably eat into the next one is that um, the mechanisms the two pro predominant mechanisms for instability actually come from the um, the inviscid equations itself so if you just take the inviscid equation that is sufficient for you to actually see that there is a possibility of an algebraic growth in the system uh without bringing in viscosity viscosity just allows you to arrest it in some ways any other question so it is possible to have a transient growth without it becoming non linear right Uh, are you going to yeah so that that would depend on the degree of amplification so okay. if the see whether a linear instability or transient growth uh, that leads you to a, a non linear state so obviously linear instability will always lead you to a non linear state because by definition the growth is unabated uh, but for a transient growth whether it takes you to the non linear state that would depend on the uh, degree to which it is the system is being amplified so if you have i mean uh, because you have ignored those non linear terms so if you have a orders of magnitude amplification in the energy before it decays that orders of magnitude amplification of energy is sufficient for you to be pushed into a regime where the non linear terms are also equally important okay thank you any other question if there aren't any more then uh, we will uh, pause it here and resume at 6 uh, so that's a little less than 2 hours from now uh, so if possible keep some uh, a uh, pen and paper with you because we are mostly trying to will try to work out some problems this was like a more general overview of all that is there or all that we can possibly discuss i've obviously skipped over the end where i wanted to talk about the transient growth part because that's not so crucial for what would be the upcoming lecture so which is why i'm uh, glossing over it but uh, the next one we will try to derive uh, certain things so it's better that uh, if you if you can keep something you can do it on the way so that if you are stuck we can do back and forth discussions uh, regarding the calculations okay uh, we'll then uh, pause here come back at 6